Man, why is my audio so quiet? What's going on here? And welcome to A Century in Cinema. This is a podcast where we discuss a classic film from every year. My name is Arthur. And I'm Andrew. And I think I got that out of order this week, but... It's something felt a little off about it. I think we usually do our names first, and then I say what the podcast is. Well, since we're off, I'm just going to do this part. This week's film is Rome, Open City from 1945. Directed by Roberto Rossellini. And you can always find where the films are streaming in our show notes. I myself watch this on the Criterion channel. I think it's also available on HBO Max. Should probably just get used to hearing this at this point. There is a physical copy of this film in my home. So, as you heard, we're in the year 1945. Obviously, this is the end of World War II. Adolf Hitler commits suicide as Russian forces invade Berlin. The European war officially ends May 7th. But already, there's some tension within the Allied forces between the communist power of the Soviet Union and the Western powers like the United States, Britain, France. And these two factions were never friends. They were on the same side out of necessity. And in August, the U.S. reveals they've completed their secret atomic bomb project. They bomb Japan with nuclear weapons, and Japan surrenders on August the 14th. And very quickly, this creates even more tension, because now the United States has atomic bombs as we go into our post-war years. Let's see, the United Nations is formed this year... Uh, Vietnam declares independence from France, which we'll come back to later. George Orwell publishes Animal Farm this year. Um, films. You know any films from 1945 off the top of your head? 1945. Well, Brief Encounter was David Lean's final collaboration with Noel Coward. It's a culmination of many films, including adaptations of plays, and is considered one of the greatest British films ever made. Alfred Hitchcock released his dizzying fever dream thriller Spellbound, featuring sequences conceived and partially directed by Salvador Dali. And Billy Wilder's The Lost Weekend. A lot of uh, great films. Detour came out this year. I Know Where I'm Going is a Michael Powell film that I haven't seen, um, but I've been interested in it for a while. I think that's it. That's all we got. That's it. That's it for the week, actually. So it was nice talking with you, Arthur. All right. Have and a good one, man. <laughs> yeah, this was a great episode. <laughs> oh, no, wait, we have a masterpiece to talk we about. Do, we, we do. We have... do. Now, this one is interesting, Rome Open City, because there is no there is no real plot in the traditional sense. It's more of a series of events that happen over the course of a couple of days. Do we dare take a stab at that? Let's see. I think in broad strokes, we can call this an ensemble piece. Yes. Every time I thought I was encountering the main character, it turned out that I was wrong. Either they'd get killed by Nazis or they'd become less interesting as someone else became the center of the film, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd say the first half of the film is really just a sort of exploration of a small community of people. They're all sort of involved with the underground resistance movement in Rome during the Nazi occupation between 1943 and 1944, sort of that winter period of time. And then one of the men is captured and their wife is shot down in the streets about halfway through the film. And from there, we we start to really follow a neighborhood priest who was looking after the community and sort of involved in the resistance, but he was just involved in charity. And now the Nazis are pressing their thumb and trying to get information out of him and another man involved with the resistance, a communist. And it all culminates in a brutal, brutal torture scene and a firing squad. And life goes on. Yeah, that was that was pretty good, actually. I feel like I ask this question at the beginning of so many podcasts, but it's just because I'm genuinely curious. Is this your first Rossellini film? (laughs) (laughs) 
Yes, this is my first Rossellini film, and what a film. This was my first with him as well. For clarification, not for this podcast. In the past, I've seen many of his films now. But I think this is the best way to start off with him. Yeah, and this is a great introduction to the genre of film that it represents, that Italian neorealist movement. Yes, absolutely. But we'll talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure. Yes. First, actually... Let's look at a review from the time period. Let's start off with the review. Usually we save this for the end, but let's look at what the New York Times film reviewer had to say about this. What was his name? Bosley Crowther. He's back. For those who don't remember, Bosley Crowther waved off Dance Girl Dance. We didn't agree with his opinions there. He really loves this film, though. Yes, he gets this one. So so he gets this one. I, I, I assume you agree with everything he's saying here. The universal, the praise, the... Uh, lavishing the... Uh, you know, I have to say, this this film has been an interesting experience for me within this project. Because watching this film independently, just watching it, knowing it's Rome Open City, knowing of its reputation, and knowing it's a classic film, and having already seen films in neorealism, there was a certain level that I was expecting and then was delivered. But watching it within the context of what we've been watching up to this point... And its placement in history, I really do understand how this film was such a shock to so many people. This feels like such a turning point for film in general. We've never seen anything this violent. No. And I don't think you can get a film this violent, dirty and real without going through World War II, without having lived through these years of brutal anguish, war everything going on in Europe. Absolutely. It does feel as if this movie sort of represents how film and art in general will just never be the same after this war. What stood out to you in this review? Anything that you... Oh, I really love his whole take. I'll just read this quote. I love this quote. Anger, grim and determined against the Germans and collaborationists throbs in every sequence and every shot in which the evil ones are shown. Yet the anger is not shrill or hysterical. It is the clarified anger of those who have known and dreaded the cruelty and depravity of men who are their foes. It is anger long since drained of astonishment or outrage. More than anger, however, the feeling that flows most strongly through the film is one of supreme admiration for the people who fight for freedom's cause. It is a quiet exultation conveyed mainly through attitudes and simple words illuminating the spirit of devotion and sacrifice. I would agree with that. That's it. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. You sort of feel helpless as an audience member. You feel as if you're watching something that you want to be able to somehow fix or stop and there's nothing you can do. I also see here in the review the the stringent necessity for economy compelled the producers to make a film that has all the appearance and flavor of a straight documentary. And I even asked you this last week, if this was a scripted film or a documentary, because I I just look at it and it looks so real. It looks so authentic, Mm -hmm. even though it is scripted, even though there are characters being played and there's moments of melodrama, certainly. The heart and soul of this film feels so authentic. It does feel like a documentary, like you are just there watching real people struggling to survive and going through this horrifying time in their city's history. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I, 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 there's a, there's really, there's so much to love in this film. I think this film is a masterpiece. One of the best we've watched so far. Oh yes. I, I love the feeling you get watching this, that it's a, it's a moment in history, but life will go on. There was a time before this and there will be a time after this. All the monuments in Rome that are still standing from time past and the hopeful future that will come from this, that will that will march on. Right. I love that the film ends with the the children and whatever they will experience later in life. That's that's the uh, that's the future. It sort of ends with them being scarred for life. That's sort of the final image of the film is you watching these children see their hero, the the man who defended them and who they knew they could go to for help, be brutally murdered right in front of them through a gate. And they look down despondently. Yeah, the priest. 
But at the same time, I do think what the priest said earlier, earlier during the torture scene, the Nazis have destroyed this man's body, but they never destroyed his soul. I think that's a, that's supposed to be a sort of synecdoche for the whole film. There, the war did end up destroying so much of the physical city, but its spirit will continue on in some way. Uh, certainly scarred, but there is a hopeful look towards the future that I think a lot of people could appreciate at this time. Hmm. And then also in this review, uh, he points out that this will likely prove somewhat shocking to sheltered American audiences. Yes. It's hard to really fathom what audiences in Europe would make of this film after having lived through the war versus what Americans would feel like and versus what we feel like because we're so detached from the events, not only through space, but also through time. So there is something really monumental about this film that I feel like people in Europe would gain that we just will never appreciate. Aldo Fabrizi plays the priest and his monologue after the torture scene at the end of the film, just this string of curses against the Gestapo Nazis. That's not acting. That's a, a person genuinely sobbing and cursing the invaders who tore apart his city and desecrated this religious site. This film is a real record of a feeling that existed at this time. Especially when you consider what we've been discussing concerning the Hayes Code, as far as the tepidness towards criticizing other countries, the tepidness in showing violent crimes, to have watched so many films over the past few weeks that are trying to be clever and tiptoe around certain subject matters so that they can include them without being censored and then to watch something this brutal that is so unflinching in its depiction of everything it wants to convey it was i mean yeah it's so funny because i've seen this film before but i was genuinely shocked watching this last night i can't even truly describe the emotion i was sitting there thinking I loved this movie the first time I saw it, and I'm watching it right now, and something about it is gripping me harder than it ever did before. I think just putting it in the context of the other films we've been watching, it really just cemented how huge of a moment something like this must have been. Yeah, it was refreshing in a weird way. Yes, I would agree. Uh, you know, a similar film, To Be or Not To Be, was still kind of tiptoeing around things and uh, exactly what you said, yes. I have to sneak in a quick recommendation. I might have even brought up this film before, but anyone who's watching along, if you are looking for something that reflects the brutality of war and also rides the strange line of complete narrative but feeling like you're watching a documentary, I cannot recommend the 1966 film Battle of Algier enough. I think it takes this horrifying wartime realism idea to a place that people couldn't really even conceive of film going in the 40s. So just kind of sneak that one in. It's a good supplementary film to this one. I wanted to watch Bicycle Thieves right after this. Oh. I've seen it before in a film class. But again, just having gone through this project, watching alongside, you know, our little history updates and everything. I do feel like I'd appreciate that film way, way more than, you know, sitting in class trying to make sure I got everything for the test. Yes, I love that movie. But um, Rome Open City. So this film was in pre-production. It was being written during the Nazi occupation. It was being developed in secret, according to Rossellini, which was na naturally pretty hard to do. Rome is liberated and it goes into production five months later. Yes, August 1944 is when the occupation was officially fully pushed out, and January 1945 was when the film went into production, which is insane to think about. Just thinking about trying to produce a film in general, it's, all, it's always a miracle when any film can get 
made. I mean, it, it requires just enormous amounts of manpower, so much money, et cetera, et cetera. You add on top of that, <laughs> everything going on in Rome at this time, uh, this is a miraculous film. And I was listening to an interview with Rossellini where he's saying they're just trying to get film stock, right? They're, there's literally not enough film stock in the city to make a film. So they have to scrape together different kinds of film stock and everything. And you can actually see that as you're watching the film, the different takes have a different sort of grain to them, a different sort of look. You can, you can even see that. And it adds to that documentary feel too. Like they're really just trying to put this film together. Correct me if I'm wrong. There were still cities in Italy that were occupied while this film was being made. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. It's a big, complicated war, but from what I understand, the Allies came in through the south and liberated southern Italy and then Rome. But yeah, there were still cities up north that were still occupied by the Germans and the fascists. You can feel it in this movie. It's so palpable. They are talking about things everyone involved seems to have experienced firsthand. The location, the way Rome itself looks, because it's still completely shredded i mean the location is a main character the reason why the title of the film is rome open city because the way the buildings are decaying the way certain rooms haven't been attended to the way the main square looks it just all looks as if it's been a battleground to a certain extent there is a perpetual layer of dust and debris that is on every single street and in every sidewalk. Yes, there has not been time to clean up the city. You still feel like battles were freshly fought there. It gives something that it, I don't think there's any way you could possibly replicate this with sets or even with a really well-dressed location. I truly don't think you could replicate that feeling of desperation and dissolution that is in this film. And felt throughout the city. Do you know where the term open city comes from? Do you happen to know this? I don't. I thought this was interesting, so I'll drop it in here. Uh, open city in military terms is a city that the occupying forces, whether they be invaders or the original founders, are not going to defend. They have declared it an open city for the sake of the citizens and for the sake of the historical the cultural significance. They don't want the enemy to bomb it. They don't want any battles to take place. It is an open city for the new occupying force to come in and take. So Rome was declared an open city. Fascinating. And there are lingering shots of, you know, the Vatican and the monuments throughout the city, the statues that, you know, would have been lost if, uh, if the Allies have to bomb it, or if the Axis powers were to burn everything on their way out. Obviously, there are cities that are not as lucky in wartime, but uh, Rome is still standing, and we still have precious artifacts from, from history that still exist in the city. So, a lot of this film, the shaky cam, the really intense sequences, I mean, even so much as people falling over certain effect shots, it was never planned to look like that, but they had to get what they had to get. And that sort of became kind of a basis for neorealism. And it's interesting because even though, I mean, it is a style and therefore is a stylistic choice. It wasn't technically an intentional stylistic choice, mm -hmm. but because of all of those elements coming together, it sort of formed a movement in cinema. And this wasn't considered the very first uh, Italian neorealist film, but it is considered a huge starting point. It's one of the most infamous. And I, and I think if you're looking at it in technical terms, it's the third or fourth. So neorealist, Italian neorealism, um, um, but also defined by, I, I know they use a lot of just regular people, right? They're not using actors. They're using citizens or people who actually are bakers or the profession that the character is. Yes. You'll have some actors playing your bigger parts. I mean, Aldo Fabrizi and Anna Magnani are both established actors at this point. 
Aljo for Breezy, he's the priest. Uh, the other name was? Anna Magnani. She played uh, Pina, the woman who was going to get married and then gets brutally shot in the streets. Okay. okay. At the end of part one. They were both established dramatic actors. Yes. Okay. But they would, they were normally surrounded by regular people who were citizens of that town. And I think that lends a lot to a performance as well as the people you're surrounded by. Another major mark of Italian neorealism is the lack of a true plot, more of a series of events or taking place over a certain amount of time. And uh, this film, I think, does that beautifully. Another thing you mentioned, I, I always imagine uh, these films and this genre, or I guess this movement, I always imagine this movement of filmmaking being rather depressing. When I think of Bicycle Thieves, I you know don't think uplifting thoughts. This movement really came out of World War II. It was this desire to share pain through an art form. So... I think with the perspective being on that aspect, it probably felt more realistic to be very sad. <sighs> yeah, it's it's a horrifying movie, truly, and I love it. But it, this is this one's definitely the heaviest I think we've watched so far. It's a hard one. Yeah, it's a hard one. But definitely worth it. Like uh, like I said, I do think this is a masterpiece. Yes. And you can see why this is the kind of film that's studied for years and years after it comes out. I cannot remember what the name of the person is, but in his introdu- in Rossellini's introduction to this film, he mentions that it was screened for a producer, an American producer. And the producer left. And when he asked him his thoughts on the film, he said, that's not a film. Like, like, it's not a film like, that's not what films look like. That's not what films feel like. That's not what films are supposed to do for people. You know, it, this is a, this one's a big rule breaker. I mean, we've watched some pretty, some pretty non-standard films up to this point, And experimental cinema is really starting to bubble up at this point. But this one, which is going for certainly a, an audience, you know, this doesn't feel like some experimental film they're hoping gets screened at a museum. This feels like a movie that is meant to be seen by large amounts of people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with a large cast. And it's yeah. And I, I yeah, I know I keep saying this, but I can just understand how this was a big shock to the system. Yeah. But the audiences have changed. They've been through this hell. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, this film does have a melodramatic feeling to it. I mean, you mentioned that some of the actors are dramatic players. They are people who come from a background in theater and whatnot. I mean, Harry Feist, the guy playing the German Gestapo leader, feels like he's acting throughout the film. He has a sort of way of moving that feels very much like ballet almost. You know, that kind of clashes with the realistic feelings of this film. But at the same time, it still works, right? It still works. Yes. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that. I'm just, I guess it's the, the. I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting. That's okay. Do you know how many times I do that on these podcasts? Oh, wait, you definitely <laughs> do. <laughs> I, I, I really liked that character, though, the, the Gestapo leader. <laughs> He's well, well played. You hate him so much. Yeah, in general, all of the... It feels like so much more of a risk at this point to be playing one of the German soldiers than to play (laughs) any other character in this film. Yeah. So kudos, because they all really nail it. Now, I understand that Rossellini claims he's not a religious man. He doesn't believe in God. But that feels hard to fathom after watching this film, because religion plays a huge role in this film and what it, I think it's saying about the city of Rome, um, how important Catholicism is and the role of the priest in society and all of this. But um, yeah, Rossellini says he's an atheist. Yeah, I would agree that this film feels very religious and it even brings up atheism and the priest more or less says, even if you're an atheist, 
as far as my beliefs go, you could still be a follower of God. You're just following him in a different way. Yeah, which is a beautiful exchange. Like, I think that could speak to Rossellini's own beliefs. Yeah. The relationship between the priest and his communist friend in the resistance who's being tortured. Um, obviously, communism stresses secularism. The guy's an atheist. Um, but they are still obviously on the same side against evil. I feel like that's sort of what Rossellini is trying to, to encompass in this film. Absolutely. I understand he goes on to make many more films that do center on religion as a theme. And I, I, I'm really curious to see more of more of those. Um, it's clearly a subject that he's interested in, even if he's an atheist. Yeah, he discusses religion in his film pretty frequently. So you have here in our notes that this was submitted to the first ever Cannes Film Festival. So, yes. And they're, you know, probably not, but some people might already be clicking away saying that's incorrect. The Cannes Film Festival has a very interesting history, which I thought would fold in nicely into this episode. It technically had its first uh, its first year in 1939, the golden year, as we've already discussed. Okay. It was created out of a frustration with the Venice Film Festival, which had existed since 1932 and was at the time the only international film festival. However, there was solid proof that Mussolini and Hitler were highly involved in the voting, structuring, and choosing of films for that festival. And... The Venice Film Festival. The Venice Film Festival. Yeah, well, that's a problem. Yes. Uh, it... <laughs> A film I mentioned a few episodes ago, Jean Renoir's Grand Illusion, was actually forbidden to win by Mussolini, and so it did not. And there were even films submitted that were never screened by anyone. Um, I know there was one called Coppa Mussolini, and uh, there was a German documentary about the 1936 Summer Olympics. Just there, there was a lot of influence from those two leaders into the festival and this festival was created out of a desire to separate and to have an international film festival that was not being influenced by those political powerhouses so when you say that this was the first Cannes film festival in 45 why was that the first so the Cannes film festival started in 1939 and it had one night and the next day, Germany invaded Poland, and it all got shut down. And they did not have another festival until this year. So this was the first fully completed festival. There were still there was there were award there were awards given for that first festival, but not all of the films were screened. The whole thing had to be stopped. So this really is considered the first official con film festival. And then this goes on to win the dramatic prize or some sort of jury award. So it won the Grand Prix, which is actually to this day by the Cannes Festival considered to be the Palme d'Or. There was no Palme d'Or at the time. So this was the highest award you could receive. What's strange about it is that there are multiple films that received this award that year. But again, this was, you know, the first ever one. So they're allowed to make up rules a little bit. <laughs> one of the films that also won was Brief Encounter, the David Lean film I mentioned earlier, and The Lost Weekend, the Billy Wilder film I mentioned earlier, as well as many others. Rossellini's, <laughs> Rossellini's perspective is not a positive one, which is funny because it did win that award, but he describes it as him being the only person in the theater while the film was playing, and... It was not a very well-discussed or well-liked film at the festival. So, you know, winning an award does not necessarily mean the buzz was there, which I think is just a little humorous. And, you know, that might just be him feeling a little cynical or not knowing the actual events. But that's just his perspective on it. It should be stated, um, this film did not have a very positive reception in Italy upon release. For the main reason that people were wanting something more escapist than this film. And 
especially if you were living in Italy, especially if you were living in Rome, I can understand how watching this film later in 1945 might have been just a bit much. I can understand that. Right, but at the same time, it was a popular film eventually. It did, yes. It it found its audience. Found an audience. I think people were ready to start, yeah, discussing the war head on and talking about what was going on. I mean, especially, you know, considering televisions weren't even really that popular in households yet, right? It was more the radio at this point. Yeah, yeah. You know, as far as visual documentation of the war, there wasn't a whole lot of it just yet. Um, okay, so this is our last year of World War II, 1945. Ah. Um, we talked about why we don't love the war genre. Did we ever talk about, like, our favorite World War II films? I don't know. I don't think we did. Yeah, let's let's look at this up. Let's see what we got here. Have you heard of this uh, Captain America, the first Avenger? I thought that was World War I for some reason. <laughs> I really did. I've only seen it once. You were you borrowed my Blu-ray of that. Isn't that funny? Now that I've told you, I've only watched that once. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what possessing man. I just I saw that first Avengers movie and I loved it so much that mm-hmm. I was like, I've seen a couple of them and I just want to own this whole like first series. And I think that's a great thing to own. Pull up. <laughs> there are some that do. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm going to talk about Thin Red Line, but like they're. Oh yeah. If I had to pick a favorite World War II movie, I think I'd pick uh, Grave of the Fireflies. That was the first movie we ever watched together. Oh, is that when we met each other? Yeah. Should we talk about that? Do we want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Why not? You probably remember it more than I do. Your memory is better than mine. Um, I love Grave of the Fireflies. It's a film I had seen a few times before, and I was with our mutual friend Graham, and he mentioned he wanted to introduce me to you and your roommate. Was their name Kelly? Yep, Kelly. Yep. We were at your place and I immediately saw you had the Criterion Godzilla, which Graham had never seen before. I don't remember. We were debating between a few films and you mentioned Grey with the Fireflies. And you seemed really passionate about that one. Studio Ghibli. Love Studio Ghibli. It was one of the ones I hadn't seen. Um, World War II film told from the perspective of two children in the Tokyo fire bombings. All right. It's an animated film. I just dis- what I distinctly remember, the 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 biggest imprint you made, um, you said, I want to watch this, but I've heard it has a really sad ending. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, has anyone here seen this before? And nobody had. And I said, oh. It's not the ending. This is a sad movie. It does not stop. (laughs) And everyone was cool with it and everyone agreed to it. And I remember we were maybe 20 minutes in and they're homeless. They can't eat. They can't find shelter. And you made a comment like, wow, you were not kidding. This is really depressing. And I said, oh, it gets worse. (laughs) (laughs) Can you believe that Studio Ghibli double build grave of the fireflies with my neighbor totoro that's perfect i that's i would show that double feature to somebody definitely in that order too like lift them up at the end make them feel a little better uh, a great world war ii film downfall if anyone's ever seen you might have seen the meme of Hitler freaking out and people change the subtitles. That meme is hilarious. That is a scene from the film Downfall. And it. I watched that film after having seen the meme. And it really... It, that scene is so dark and so frightening that it almost was better that way because I had no idea what the context surrounding it was outside of, you know, obvious historical context of who Hitler is. But as far as where it happens in the film, it is a very terrifying sequence. And that's a really great movie, really great central performance. Okay, you have to remind me, Downfall is a film told from the perspective of Hitler and his uh, uh, entourage as the Soviet army is coming down on Berlin, right? And it's all leading up to his suicide? Yes, it it starts, it's in April of 1945. Okay. But probably if I had to pick an all-time favorite World War II film, it would be Das Boot. 
Oh, the German submarine film. Yes. Um, I cannot think of a more tense or terrifying movie. It's four and a half hours. I started when I first watched it, I started it at 11 p.m. with the intention of watching the first half of it that night and the second half of it the next night. And I could not look away and it zipped by, but also just, I mean, every muscle in my body was clenched by the end of that film. And it's, it is artistry. That movie is a piece of art. I've just never seen anything on that scale as far as how tension is delivered and the ending is horrifying and it's just a great investing film. Um, I love Das Boot. So I would probably say that's my favorite. The thing I remember most from Das Boot, and it is a great film, is just how claustrophobic it is. That set is tiny and people are, you know, having to squeeze through it. And the entire time I'm just like, oh, praise the cameraman. Um, I guess another film that I should mention, another Studio Ghibli, and my favorite Miyazaki film personally is... The Wind Rises. It doesn't feel like a World War II film. I guess it's not, uh, but it is. It, it, yeah. Uh, the Wind Rises is a good film, but it is not, you know, the harrowing sort of thing that Grave of the Fireflies is. No, it's way more about. That's a biopic. Yeah, it's way more about the invention of planes and how the wartime sort of fueled that era of invention more so than it is about the war itself. Yeah. And that earthquake sequence is one of the best things he's ever made. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that's going to be great, man. Should we stop recording? Um, no, we should mention what we're watching next week. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, next week's the first one I haven't seen before. In a long well, no, Double Indemnity. But next week we will be watching The Best Years of Our Lives, directed by William Wyler. And joining us will be my friend Dan Patterson. Dan is very well knowledge in film, and he is a big fan of this movie, and he is also an avid listener of our podcast, and we are very excited to have him join us. Looking forward to that. Yes, me too. Especially because I don't know anything about this film, and you don't either. Yeah, it's very exciting. He'll have to get it. He'll have to steer us. <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to all our Patreon members who keep the show running. Thank you all. You too can become a patron and get access to bonus episodes linked down in the show notes. You're listening on YouTube now, so like and subscribe and comment down below. Tell us if you've seen the film. What did you think of it? Do we miss anything? Thank you all for listening and we'll see you for the next one.